Wang Qishan of China, the ministers uh, from China and the ministers from Israel, Chemi Perez and the Perez family, Jack Ma. We had an extraordinary conversation yesterday. We'll talk about that later. And the distinguished uh, guests and business leaders who are here. This was fantastic. <laughs> and it was, uh, It was also uh, a little unnerving because any one of us can think about what people can say in his name or her name and it completely sounds lifelike and truthful. In this case, it was the life and truth of Shimon Peres. There's no dissonance between the fact that he wrote those words and in a computerized act of genius, he actually says those words. I remember the conversations I had with Shimon. When he spoke about innovation, and when he spoke about peace, his eyes shone. His eyes sparkled. He had a, a tremendous confidence in the youth of Israel, in the genius of Israel, and I think it's important to understand that here's where we saw completely eye to eye. Because it's called the grand opening of the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation. And the idea is that peace and innovation actually go together. That innovation is an engine of peace. It's not merely an engine of progress. It is an engine of peace. Now, I'm not speaking theoretically. Because right now, as we speak, there are quite a few uh, of the neighboring countries that are reaching out to Israel and normalizing relations with Israel, which is a step towards peace because of innovation. And they want our innovation not merely for security reasons. They want it for civilian reasons. They want it for water, they want it for health, they want it for IT, they want it for solar energy, they want it for everything, everything. They look around, they look around the region, they look around the world, as do other countries, and they see Israel as a hub of innovation that can offer a better, safer, richer life and a longer life for their peoples. And this is happening right here and right now in the Middle East. It's a boon to peace. And I believe that in, uh, when I had these conversations with Shimon, of course we discussed it in greater detail, he, his, his mind soared, always. He soared. He soared to new ideas, to new technologies, to new applications. And the idea that he had was that if we could reach the broad segments, the broad masses of the peoples of the Middle East, and they could see the promise that technology and innovation would give them for the future, that ultimately progress would win over, would win out over medievalism. And I think there is a great deal of truth there. This is why I think this, this combination of peace and innovation go hand in hand. And I'm sure that you'll be hearing about these combinations in the coming weeks and months and years in ways that will make this a much more concrete uh, materialization than just the words that I'm speaking here. You'll be able to judge that yourself. The most important thing that I could say about Shimon is that he had uh, a grand vision, a grand vision of uh, the state of Israel. He says, uh, if you don't have fantasies, you don't do fantastic things. This is true. But of course, you need also the people who actually put out, make these fantasies uh, become real. And in Israel, Israel is among the leading innovation nations in the world. Uh, Eric Schmidt, with whom I met last night and came to this conference, said that he's quoted here as Israel is second only to Silicon Valley. That's not what he told me. He said Israel is before Silicon Valley and the main things that I'm interested in. And he's doing very well here. Uh, well, we won't make that argument, but we know that countries that seek to seize the future have to develop the capacity for innovation. I was deeply impressed in my conversations 
with uh, Vice President uh, Wang Qishan about the thrust of innovation that is so powerful today, uh, from President Xi Jinping to the Vice President down to uh, the whole people of China, there's an understanding that even though China is enormous and powerful and uh, has one of the greatest economies in the world, that in China, as elsewhere, the future belongs to those who innovate. And the partnership that we have with, between China and Israel that was reflected in this joint committee that now meets annually, and just we spent a few days now doing exactly that, is meant to drive forward innovation and to benefit from the fruits of innovation in so many fields. We spoke about agriculture, we spoke about water, we spoke about areas that could literally change the life, I was going to say of millions, but you know when you're dealing with a small country like China, you should be talking about billions. By the way, I also made a very modest request. I asked that, well, I began by asking that China, you know, there's Chinese tourism to Israel. So my modest request was first for 1% of China's population. Then I narrowed it down. I said one-tenth of 1% 1 will do too because that's what I think we can accommodate at this point, but we'll grow. We have great confidence in the future, the future of our relations with China and with so many other countries, and in a f the future of our relations with countries in the Middle East. And I hope and I believe that by mid-century, we'll see a change, it could happen a lot before, a change where Shimon's vision of the fruits of progress, that it would change one society after the other, and this would lead, I believe, to a vision of peace that many seem to think today is fantastic, but it's really a reality that could come to bear. I will say this, that we always thought that if we solve the Palestinian problem, it will open up the, Arab for, open up the doors to peace with the broader Arab world. And that's certainly true. Uh, if you could do it. But it may be that equally true, and perhaps even truer, is that if you open up to the Arab world and you normalize relations with them, it will open the door for an eventual reconciliation and peace with the Palestinians. We should do both. But I think you should not underestimate, do not underestimate the openness and the thirst in the Arab world today for Israel, and the reason, the first reason before anything else is that word there, innovation. Everybody sees this, everybody understands this, and everybody understands that Israel is a hub of innovation. We have here uh, unbelievable uh, examples of uh, companies, uh, for example, detecting cancer. A Technion professor recently developed a breathalyzer, a breathalyzer test for lung cancer. That's amazing. That's just amazing. And think what it does for mankind, for womankind. I mean, think of what it does. It's extraordinary. Hands-free smartphone. Two Israelis developed the world's first smartphone for people who have limited use of their hands. That is a social benefit, a piece of social justice. I think it's tremendous. This is something I've witnessed myself, an exoskeleton walking device. An Israeli company, Rewalk, allows paraplegics to walk again, not only to walk, to climb stairs. And if you haven't seen it, you should. Uh, it's, it just puts out a tremendous sense of hope from the heart. And of course, driverless car technology, Israel has become, as you know, uh, a real power, a global power in autonomous vehicles, uh, you know Mobileye, but there are 500 other companies, just 500 other startups that have received billions of dollars, I'm not talking about the 15 billion that went from Intel to Mobileye, but billions of dollars spent now over recent years on these 500 companies, and uh, I would say, uh, if I can borrow a phrase, uh, Mr. Vice President, let a thousand startups bloom, well, we have thousands and thousands of startups that are blooming in all these areas and more. And I think the future of the world is intimately connected to our ability to innovate. I said yesterday that the past, the 
progress of human beings in our history, which is rather brief on this planet, uh, and the, prog the history of progress is even briefer, but it's all the progress of innovation. There is always someone or a group of people who at a particular point in time identify a possibility that others do not see. And I began with the spark, the spark of fire, when man first used fire, and then you proceed step after step. Somebody saw a possibility that didn't exist before. And at first, it remains within the province of that individual or a close segment, but soon it becomes the benefit of all humanity. That's the history of progress that is picking up pace and now is accepting, is becoming geometric in its acceleration. There's so many possibilities, again, because of AI, because of big data, because of connectivity, because of the merging of all of that, because of science, and because of the merging of science and applications, and the narrowing of distance. The governor of New Jersey, Perhaps Jack Ma would like to know this. The governor of New Jersey was in my office uh, the other day, and he told me, he told me there are two things that are occupying, preoccupying him. One is he's competing for the center of Amazon. Jack, tell him Alibaba is there too. The second, he said, I asked him, well, what about that small university you have there? Princeton. He said, funny you should say that, because Princeton is perhaps the greatest center of theoretical mathematics in the world. But what we're doing right now is persuading them to bring it closer to market. And that has at least as much potential as anything else. Last night, uh, Jack Ma and I spoke about some vision of the future, how you could actually get this technology of innovation to serve small businesses that will proliferate worldwide and you can give them access to worldwide markets. They don't need enormous scale. This is a, an exceptional vision that you have. I suggested to the Vice President of China and the Chinese government and of course to all entrepreneurs from China and elsewhere that we partner in joint ventures on our Agricultural Research Institute the Volcani Institute, which I believe is the best in the world. We can feed the planet. We can feed the planet with new plants. We can feed the planet with new proteins. We don't have to destroy the environment in order to raise cows, the most inefficient way of producing protein ever invented. We can do it with fish, tiny fish in the ocean, in the sea. Israel has that technology. We want to partner on technology, not only IT, and not only on health, on food, on water, the things that people need. It's all here. It's a remarkable story, the story of Israel, its capacities. There are many explanations of how it came about, and I think they're the sources of our, of our genius are in our culture. We had to open up our economy, create a market-oriented economy to have that genius burst forth, burst forth, but it's here now. And I think the one person with whom I shared so many nights, so many evenings talking about that, and saw the sparkle in his eye is Shimon Peres. I just saw it again. And I wish I could communicate to him. And in a way, we are. And to tell him, that this dream of his is coming true. And the fact is, we're all here today telling him it's happening and more will happen. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.